fairness is the cornerstone of critical thinking, we have an obligation to the other person with whom we disagree to try to represent their argument back to them in the best possible light. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Amir Approved. This time we have an encore, you know, one of the two most recommended guests, uh, Dr. Christopher DiCarlo and my good buddy Cal. And uh, the response from last episode, a couple episodes back, has been great. You know, people really enjoy the deep, rational conversations that we're having. Excellent. And uh, just I, for the record, let's yeah. let's be honest, ninety-five-five, maybe. Cal- <laughs> I'll give myself that much it's credit, a, but no a, more than that. It's a triage chemi- <laughs> chemistry over here. It's a joint effort. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking and, of uh, which, without actually having joints. Without, <laughs> next time. Next round, time. Next round, time. Round three: joints or shrooms. We'll ah. Yeah. Shrooms and, uh, have been wonderful. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Never done them before. Let's try yeah, that. Let's try that. <laughs> On, try. Air. Yeah. On air. On <laughs> air. But what I want to start off uh, at the beginning of this episode is you've written a book about rational thinking, mm-hmm. asking better questions. And I think it doesn't matter where you are in your life right now. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, a millionaire, or homeless. I think having the tool sets and capabilities of asking better question in my mind is a superpower Mm -hmm. and so i kind of want to lead you know put this towards you is like what are steps that people can take today to get these tool sets to ask better questions right i mean there's quite a few resources out there available i can't just pimp my own my own material um but you know there are plenty of critical thinking websites and challenges online that people can find um, there are shows they can listen to because just by listening to shows and opening your mind and broadening your mind, you kind of through osmosis start to pick up those skills, right? Because you, you know, especially if somebody calls somebody out on bullshit, you know why, you know, you know that they've violated some rule of logic or they've committed some fallacy of reason somewhere. They might not give, always give a, a name to the face kind of thing, but they will be able to get it intuitively. And then if they want to more formally structure their reasoning skills, they can go on and they can find, you know, all kinds of stuff. But again, I'm obviously biased. I've taken these skills and kind of distilled them to try to make it as easy as possible for people, uh, not only to read and remember, but to apply. So, um, yeah. Can we, can we actually dissect the A, B, C, yeah, D, sure. E, Fs? I thought that was really Please, interesting. Yes. Yeah. yeah, sure. So I took what I think are the six most foundational skills uh, or tools of the critical thinking skill set. And they just follow the, you know, the mnemonic of A to F. So A is for argument. So right off the bat, we talk about what is an argument. And part of the problem with critical thinking that I'm mentioning in this, the next book that's coming out in May is that the, the very term critical thinking can scare people. Because they almost immediately think you're going to criticize me. You're going to find something wrong with me. And they get their hackles up about it. And it's almost anxiety invoking to say critical thinking. But I can't call it. I've tried. If you guys can come up with a sweeter, better, more precise term. Constructive feedback. Constructive thinking. (laughs) Right. But you are critiquing ideas. You know, and people need to know that critical is constructive too, yeah, yeah. as well as destructive. And there's nothing wrong with destructive criticism. If your uh, ideas suck, we need to call you out on that. And we need the tools. The term argument, what does it bring to mind, right? Mommy and daddy are arguing. Oh, that couple over there, they're arguing. And arguing has a negative connotation to it. In critical thinking, argument is a really good thing. In fact, it's the best way in which you can put your ideas together so that people can best understand why it is you believe what you do. They might not have to agree with you, but you make it very clear to them when you put your ideas in the form of an argument. And so that's why I use the The analogy of a house. So your roof is your conclusion and you want your conclusion supported by really strong walls, which are your premises. And those premises have to satisfy the foundational criteria of things like consistency and simplicity and relevance and reliability and sufficiency. And if they do, then you have a fairly sound structure. You have a fairly sound argument. And if you don't, and one of those walls is weakened, your premises are not very well researched or you didn't get it from a reliable source, then that wall comes down and maybe so does your roof 
come down as well. So that anal analogy, I think, plays fairly universally around the world for teaching people that arguments are good things and put your ideas into that structure and do the same with others. If you don't quite understand what another person is saying, try to imagine and get them. What is your overall point? You know, you force them. And then fairness is the cornerstone of critical thinking. We have an obligation to the other person with whom we disagree to try to represent their argument back to them in the best possible light. Don't be coy. Don't be slimy. Don't try to misconstrue it or create a straw man out of it. Steel man it. We're using this term now, steel manning an argument. It shows intellectual maturity for me to be able to tell you what your argument is so that you go, yeah, yeah. In fact, you even put some stuff in there I didn't even think of. It's funny yeah, you this bring is what, it up. Like uh, Chris Voss, he's a B-O-S-S. -S. He has a great book called Never, Sp uh, Never Split the Difference. Ah, okay. And he's an F he was an FBI uh, interrogator working for negotiations. Right, right, right. And he has a chapter in the book called That's Right. And one of his best strategies is he, he wants to reiterate the person's belief system better than he or she can do it to a point to yeah. say, that's right. Yep. Yeah. But this is this is what I dislike about most arguments and especially with politicians. You know, you 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 see this in the social media space. Somebody says a sentence, somebody picks that one point, and instead of understanding the whole point, now we're going down this rabbit uh, rabbit hole of like insignificance because somebody is paying attention to a point instead of understanding the whole picture and That's right. the, the whole perspective of what that person's saying. And the and sooner we often. realize that fairness really is, and nobody the, wins. is the cornerstone. And it, it yeah. go, it's got to go both ways. It's about civility as well, right? We've lost touch with that. We've lost that capacity to be civilized towards one another in disagreement. It's easy to get along when we agree, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's having a good time. Everybody agrees. Once you get disagreement, though, you know, and this is what C.S. Lewis called the art of disagreement. We have to relearn that. I'm afraid we're going to have to reteach that to students. That it's okay. We're always going to disagree. We're never always going to be 100% on board yeah. of every detail of every aspect. Of but life. I think I think social media and internet has a role to play because funny thing is I, I was watching like old debates between Milton Friedman. I was just about to say Milton that. Oh. In the 70s and 70s, 60s Milton and Friedman. 80s. Yeah. yeah, Bob, I'm just looking how the, yeah, how the students behave and asking really articulate questions. That's right. And I'm like, fuck, world of a difference now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. William, now everyone's shouting at each yeah. other. William F. Buckley, those guys, they, they really knew how to have dialogue and disagree without being reduced to an ad hominem, without, you know, calling the other person names or whatever. Yeah. Look at Trump. Look at all the names he had for people. Yeah. Like, he immediately goes to the ad hominem, right? Because I guess in his business mind or whatever, that's how you get the, gain the upper hand or whatever, right? You, you demean the other person or yeah. have some kind of power struggle. I really enjoyed the exercises in the book, uh, How to Be a Really Good Pain in the Ass. Mm -hmm. Was it good or great? How to become a really good. Good, pain in the ass. So basically, um, it was a script, mm -hmm. somebody having a discussion, and then using the tools, we would break it down and say, well, where is the conclusion, the thesis? What's the roof? What's the supporting? And what, what's, the, uh, what's the foundation here? Right. And something as simple as that can be replicated in schools. And I thought that was really interesting. I wish this kind of stuff was done more uh, to help people understand. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did take it into the school system in 2016, 2017. I was granted the right with the Minister of Education at that time, Liz Sandals for Ontario, to go into some high schools for a pilot project. Mm -hmm. And it went extremely well. But at that time, the Ministry of Education was dealing with yet another strike with teachers and staff. I don't know if you remember that. But after it was settled, I mean, she was very honest with me. She said, if I come down now after we've settled all this and I heavy handedly say, you have to now teach critical thinking, that'll be one more point for them to, up for resistance, right? To say, really, we just got all this settled and now you want us to do X? She said, it's far better to come up from the ground, from the school boards up, get it into the school boards, get them using it, and then that'll influence other school boards. So I've been trying to do that for years now, but it's kind of a, <clears throat> an uphill battle. It, it's know? wild to me that that is not one of the most important classes to be taught in schools, how to think, mm -hmm. uh, how to project manage, how to think, how to learn. These are some of the basics. I know. You know it, it surprises me, even um, at the university and college level, 
where I see our interns, our young people who are working with us that are still going to school part-time doing these assignments, there is no structure for them to understand. The ones that have, are working with us or have gone, come through uh, an internship, they understand how, how to PM, how to organize people, how to, how to divvy up the work, how to do something like as simple as like you know cards and scrum. None of this stuff is taught at school, but yet you're given uh, an assignment and you have a month to do it or two months to do it, and if that young person doesn't have the family structure or the connections to understand, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what? I saw my, my parents know how to do a project and this falls into place. This is a project. How the hell are they supposed to know? This is why like kids do worse in school than they could. They could potentially be doing so much more if they oh. learn things like critical thinking, things like how to project manage a project. Yeah, we assume students know how to think, that they come ready-made. They don't. There are rules. There are rules for thinking. And when you violate them, we can... We can call you out on those, and we should be called out as well. So, yeah, argument first, A is for argument, then B, bias. B is for bias. You bias, have yeah. to understand that no human is without bias. So understand, do what I call the mirror test. Start figuring out what are the, you know, the, the, the natural and the cultural biases that have led to your believing what you now do about a particular issue. And what if you were born somewhere out somewhere else in the world, or even at a different time, do you think you would still have that same belief? You know, because it's almost, you know, impossible that you wouldn't. I mean, you are a, a largely a product of your surroundings and how you were mm -hmm. raised. Mm -hmm. And if some of those beliefs come from very fundamentalist ways of looking at the world, it's going to be real difficult. Like, um, uh, one example I give is uh, <clears throat> a fundamentalist Christian maintaining that uh, masturbation is a sin. Uh, and it's believed in the, in the Catholic faith, the one I was, I was raised. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Like it's, a, it's a cardinal sin. Wow. It's not just any sin. And <clears throat> the reason why is because in the 1800s, with the advent of, of high-level microscopy, they were able to see spermatozoa. And so I think it was Pope Pius, uh, I can't remember what number, 14th? Decided those little sperm are little people. They're humunculi. Uh, and therefore, you can't spill your seed on the ground. It's got one major, you know, receptacle. Mm -hmm. And that's a woman's vagina. Definitely not a man's anus. Definitely not a man's anus. And so... What then was that? <laughs> the, I'm doing rap now. I'm doing spoken word. So if you masturbate, your spermatozoa are going where God did not intend. And so that's why it's a cardinal sin. Now, you tell a 13-year-old boy, you know, that not only can you not do that, but if you do, you do know that God is watching and he's pretty much got a list and he's checking off, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's a jerk off road to hell right there if you keep doing that. <laughs> so it's like, what kind of damage are you doing to a kid's brain by telling them that? To me, to Richard Dawkins, to Lawrence Krauss, to Sam Harris, that is harm. You are now, that is child abuse. Mm -hmm. You ought not to tell a child that. Yes, you have a right to believe in your religion, and you have a right to practice your religion. But if your religion maintains that, it's fucked up. It's not, oh, well, you know, it could be right, it could be. No, it's wrong. Well, the same thing right now. Isn't the Roman Catholic still against homosexuality? Yes. Aren't loosening up on that? I don't, yeah. Fr I, don't, I don't follow. No. I don't follow. No, they're not. On. No, Francis seems to be more accepting of it. But when you push him hard enough, yeah. he'll have to stick with, you know, the central tenets of the... Like the craziest the thing I heard before is like they condemned condoms. It's not just that they condemned condoms. It got so whacked that there were bishops in Africa who were saying if you used a condom, you were more likely to get AIDS. <sighs> like it's gotten way out of hand. It's insane. So I have... A certain level of tolerance for religious belief. And so you 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 know, all of ethics can can look like this. If 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 the if the you know the y-axis is harm and the x-axis is time. Mm -hmm. And we have tolerance up here, you know, a high level of tolerance for a low level of harm as we move across time, sure. then my tolerance is going to be very high. Once the harm starts to rise, the tolerance is going to dip, and there's going to yeah. be an internet intersecting point at which we get to say, time out here. Yeah. No, no, no. You have a right to believe in this, but you then don't have a right for the entailments of that belief that cause harm to other people. 
So I think we can all agree we're cool with religion insofar as any other belief system. If you're not harming people, it's yep. really not our business, you know? But, um, and the same I would say for Islam, there, we know of cases where women are taking their young daughters to the Middle East, to Africa, to have clitorectomies. Yeah, F FGM, is it? Yeah, yeah, female genital mutilation. So how is a 14-year-old girl going to speak out against her community and say, you know what, uh, I'm going to opt out on this one? when she's pressured, you know, to follow suit, you know, and that's only one specific sect of Islam. It's not all of Islam, mm -hmm. right? So then how do we educate? How do we protect that girl? You know, and, and, and at the same time, respect a group's constitutional right to practice, you know, freedom of conscience, uh, religion, N no easy answers, but can we all agree that that is a harmful act that is highly unnecessary? You do not need to remove a woman's clitoris. Outside of therapeutic reasons, cancer, whatever, there's no, for religious reasons, I gotta say, nah, no, we can't, we can't do that. And I'll, I'll respect your views, but at that point, no, I, and I think our government actually should have the duty, the obligation to speak up and say, no, you're in Canada now. I don't think we can really honor you're going to another country to have this done. She comes back, what kind of complications could there be, right? You know, some women, some girls have bled to death. Some have had all kinds of uterine complications because of it, infections. This also brings up a good debate of like circumcision too, eh? And circumcision. You let the let the kid decide when he's 18 or 16 yeah. or whatnot if he wants to, you know, take the hood off and go convertible. That's, yeah. that's his call. Yeah. All right, so where were we? We're at the C. So C, yeah. So we've, with lots and lots of biases. Yeah, yeah. C is for... Uh, uh, context and you can't take information isolated. You know, it's always embedded in a context. Mm -hmm. and ah. The better we appreciate that context. This goes to our story of the gentleman who um, murdered his daughter 25 oh, years Robert ago. Robert Latimer. Context. I saw that as a post. Um, some young lady outraged saying, This man should go to hell and uh, this and that. And right. I clicked and I read and I was like, this is interesting. I don't know. It's not as cut and dry. Context is king, right? Like, Context is king right here because here mm -hmm. we have Tracy Latimer as a 13-year-old with severe, I think it was cerebral palsy, and constantly having uh, seizures, not very conscious, you know what I mean? Not a consciously aware uh, human being. And he just saw her health diminish and diminish and diminish and she was choking a lot and I guess he had decided in his mind that she had suffered enough and he took it upon himself to euthanize her. Mm. The problem with that is plenty of people had been euthanized by their family members and didn't didn't serve time. Oh really? Yeah because the judge would see the compassionate grounds. Yeah. It's, think, it's ridiculous now to put the brother into prison for doing something when the, the deceased had written fully out, oh, I it. wish to die. My brother is going to do this for me. And so it exonerates him. Mm. Tracy couldn't voice whether she wanted to live or not. Therefore, the judge had no <clears throat> real option but to convict him on the, a murder the, charge. The quotes from this, uh, what is it? The uh, CBC article is interesting to, to, to hear. Uh, he says, it was pointless to torture our daughter any further. She had already got, had four operations if she moved her hip, would it go? She had rods in her back. She had been worked on enough. And it goes on. Basically, to him, it was just one science experiment after another. They wouldn't let the daughter pass away. And she was just in miserable in pain. And not, you know, an itch, but severe pain. Constantly, yeah. It was not a good state to be in. So they convicted him of murder? Yes. And he yeah. served his time, and then he got out. And it was a murder in Manchester. It wouldn't be murder one. I don't know what he got. It would be two or mur or manslaughter. Yeah, because euthanasia is legal. Well, that was at a time when it wasn't. Oh, this is an old case. Oh, this is old school. This uh, is going back ten yeah, or yeah. fifteen okay. years. Okay. And don't forget what else was happening in the states. He was convicted at that time. twenty-five years ago. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Jack Kevorkian, do you remember him? Oh yeah. So Doctor Death, they called him in mm, the states. Mm -hmm. He had a machine called the uh, what do you call it? The the Thanatos machine, which is Greek for death. And it was the same three chemicals that are used in, um, you know, federal penitentiaries when the death sentence. Yeah. So the first thing is a kind of a 
a narcotic to kind of, you know, mellow you out and whatnot. The second is a major muscle relaxant mm -hmm. because when they put the toxin in, your body will naturally Seize, fight that. Yeah. And then the third one is the toxin. And uh, Kevorkian's machine worked very well. Here's something you don't know. But one of the guys you let you met at the last talk I gave yep. was a founding member of an underground organization that helped people die. Oh, wow. That's a crazy story. Dr. Richard Thane. Oh, really? And Richard. him along with John Hostess, you can look you can look this up or you can post a link mm -hmm. to this guy. It's funny. You see, uh, you meet a guy, such a sweetheart. Yeah. You just want to hug him. Well, they, they, <laughs> they helped rather notable people die. Yeah. Uh, like Canadian poets and people like that, uh, fairly famous people. But it was never written, you know, the cause of death was just they died in their sleep or whatever. But no, Interesting. It, was, it was this John Haas, this guy. He was helping them do it. I think he helped end eight lives. And then when he himself wanted to die, it was months before MAID or medical assistance in dying was legal in Canada. He had to go to Switzerland to have it done. Uh. And Richard Thane went with him. Interesting. Yeah. And death is probably the most serious decision any person is going to have to make. And if you can do it consciously, great. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of a bonus. It's the ones who can't. Yes. So yep. in our wills, my wife's and my will, we have what's called an advanced directive. And the advanced directive is to our sons who will be the powers of attorney. Yeah, I just did that with my mom. Oh, okay. She said, if I ever become a potato. Yeah. So you give the kids, you know, you say, you know, check it out. You're bright people. You, you'll know if we're having a good time or not. Yeah. And uh, make the call because. Especially I, the age too. Like if you're yeah. 80, become a potato. That's and you the thing. Life, it's like, or you develop early onset, you know, with yeah. dementia, that kind of thing. And you can't fully do that. That's the issue. We might as well jump into this right now yeah. before we get to the D and Fs. If we're talking about medical assistance and dying. When I was asked to put in my two cents about the development of it. And then they went ahead and it came back to us. A lot of bioethicists said, this doesn't account for anybody with psych psychiatric conditions or future conditions. It says six months imminent death. You got to be within that kind of window for the board to say, okay, we'll, mm. we'll, we'll grant it. And then there's two ways in which you can take yourself out. Have a doctor administer it or they just give you the prescription and you get the script filled and you do it yourself. Oh, wow. So there's two ways huh. you can do like it. Right? Socrates. A lot of doctors. I'm dressing the, the hemlock. robe and everything. Yeah. I I'd want a photo like that. <laughs> my finger, a few yeah, people, yeah. a few of my interns crying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hemlock milkshake. Yeah. Right. So the, the problem is, is that doctors really don't want to do this. We're finding out. Sure, yeah. They're not thrilled about doing this. They will. Yeah, yeah. But that's huge on them, you know, killing somebody. I What'd you do it, today, yeah. honey? Oh, I killed a few people. And so I think there should be like nurse practitioners people who are okay with doing this, mm. who are especially trained yeah. to do this kind of work. We should talk to vets to put down animals, how they feel too. Oh, I cried more Ouch. putting down a rat yeah. than I did watching both of my parents die. Interesting. Because the rat, its life, its quality of life was coming to an end. It had a tumor. It was having seizures. It wasn't having a good time. And then you have to make that decision for it. But on the way to the vet, when it's looking at you, like it's just yeah. another day yeah. and you know it's going to die, that's tough. Yeah. And mm. now that I have a dog, it's going to be even worse because it's a far more sentient being, right? Yeah. So that's going to be really tough. When a person knows they're on their way out, euthanasia literally means in Greek, good death. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, cool. So you literally uh, want to have a good death. We want a good life. What do you think of Robin Williams? Apparently he was diagnosed with something, right? Oh, he had a he, he had a he severe form of Parkinson's. Though. Did he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if he didn't, do, I, the way I look at it, if he didn't do it himself, then when he had the faculty and the ability, right, he may not have been able to do it later. Well, that's our beef: is when you have early onset dementia. How do you know where that six month window is? It's unfair, mm -hmm. and how cruel is it to know you're losing? your capacity for conscious awareness. Yeah. For an intelligent person, what what cr more cruel fate could, could await a yeah. person than to gradually realize, you know, and have their spouses say, you've asked me that. You've asked me that 26 times in a row. Have I? Have I? You can't even they feel bad like, about they it. There should be like a checklist. Like, have we tried this 
protocol, this right. protocol, this until you exhausted everything. Yeah. Then it's like, yeah. But then again, I've seen people in various stages of dementia and Alzheimer's, and even when they've lost their capacity to recognize anybody again, they seem to be having an okay time. Yeah. Like they're not in any pain. They're not in any distress. Yeah. So you play video games? You can do all kinds of stuff, but it's how do we know what they're... video game console. <laughs> There's interesting <laughs> new studies on transcranial stimulation now coming up. Like really? really, really promising research using different frequency, DC, current. Um, okay. Yeah, really, really interesting studies. One of my buddies was a pioneer in that, a guy named Michael Persinger. Okay. He, he was up in uh, Sudbury, and he did the electromagnetic mm -hmm. stuff. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, people who believe in the sanctity of life and that you shouldn't treat people, you know, as they believe as objects, as a means to an end, to put them out of their misery, so to speak, whether they're religious minded or not, believe that it's life's hardships that push us to become better people. And that's why God wants us to do it. Okay, I get that. Mm -hmm. you know, that's your belief and that's how you see things. And that's fine. The problem with that, though, is, <clears throat> A, we don't know if any such God exists. And B, we don't really know what's going on in the faculties and the level of reasoning of that person when they're in that state. So who's going to make that call? And at what point do we say their life is no longer worth living from my perspective yeah. as a person speaking on their behalf? Yeah, That's a tough call. And it's, I'm not saying it's going to get easier. I think it's going to get more complicated. My buddy Yuri on here that specializes in longevity, uh, Yamanaka factors. Uh, and so like hypothetically, let's say where research is heading, we statistically speaking, will have the ability to extend life yeah. for a very long time. Well, with telomeric sciences and that's, knowing. That's exactly it. Yeah. So let's say hypothetically yeah. within the next 50 years, we'll see the first 100 and 150 year old person yeah, through this, through this uh, that'll method. That'll be the next milestone for sure. Then the question comes like, let's say we for time, like you look at progress that we've made in the last hundred years. I can't even imagine we're going to be in the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. yep. And so we fast forward a hundred <clears throat> years from now and let's say we have the ability for you to live till 300. Mm. At what point do people say, well, I've lived my life here. Well, I'm kind of tired. My, uh, I don't know. <laughs> my buddy Jim Shea and I are like, we're sticking around yeah. as long. At least that's how we feel right if now. If I can learn yeah, keep and learning. contribute, those yeah. are the two things. As long as I can continue to learn new things and I can continue to contribute one way or another, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. The moment I feel that I can't contribute and I can't learn, I want to be off. And I've told my wife that. Mm -hmm. But it'll come in a combination of ways, right? It'll be regenerative science, figuring out how we can just make better organs, better muscles, better that kind yeah. of thing. And it'll be the transhumanism, right? Let's get the artificial parts in there of the ones that are wearing out, right? Replace them with far better materials than grow them. Or well, we can, Aubrey de Grey, we can genetically- that, That's uh, his strategy. He thinks so we're more of a, of a car. So he's like, how do you grow the mitochondria? How do you grow yeah. the, you know, ribosomes? Mm -hmm. How do you grow? How do you grow every- Grow part, a hip, grow an arm. Everything. Grow Down to everything. the cellular mechanism. Yeah. And grow it better. And like grow this, better, yeah. You know, well, yeah. we can grow skin now. We're doing skin graphing with uh, growing skin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, brave new world. Hopefully, you know, the, the biggest irony of my life is that they'll figure out how to do this, you know, a week after I'm dead. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think living longer is our problem. Yeah. I think we need to figure out how to live better before we learn to live longer, oh, yeah. which is actually the main point of our conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> going back to abcs yeah do you want me to get back yes what's Let's d finish, yeah, so, finish it off. so d is connected to a yeah it's how we can diagram our arguments so or somebody else's argument whether it's spoken written whatever and it allows us to visually then see what the house looks like and all the component parts so we know what the conclusion is that's whatever the person happens to believe you know uh, euthanasia is good, euthanasia is bad, whatever. Abortion is good, abortion is bad. That's their conclusion. But then we can see what all of their reasons are and how those reasons relate to that, that conclusion. And we can do it for our own thinking mm -hmm. as well, right? We can write down what it is we think and why it is we think that so we have a better understanding. So diagramming is like a, I call it the most boring part of the critical thinking skills, but it is so essential because it allows us to literally see what an argument looks like on paper, you know, visually get a good a good grasp of it so that we can then say it back to the other person if it's not our argument 
and then critique it much more fairly because we can literally say, is this what you mean? Yeah. Right? And they can see it and they go, yep. Yeah. Or if they disagree, we can then revise it and then begin. Yeah. E then is evidence. So many claims required and there's different types of evidence. So you got to be careful which type of evidence is best for this particular type of topic. And F just involves all of the different types of fallacies that can be committed or errors in reasoning. So I mentioned Trump uses lots of ad hominems, you know, literally Latin for against the man or against the person. Uh, usually that means you've lost the argument. You start criticizing personal characteristics yeah. about a person, you've lost. Because you're no longer addressing what they're saying. No, it's like the Persian saying, don't kill the messenger. Yeah. So you're dealing <laughs> with irrelevant. Conservatives did with uh, Jean Chrétien's with face. With Chrétien. Oh, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Conservatives in 93 did that. You that know, didn't go well. It's any anytime you demean a person. Racism is just a big ad hominem. You're mm. just you're demeaning another person for irrelevant characteristics that have nothing to do with the issue at hand. Mm -hmm. So those are the 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 six, you know, argument, bias, context, diagram, evidence, and fallacies. Those are the basic tools within the overall critical thinking skill set. If people learn what those are about and how to utilize them better, and it's like a language though. It's not. It's not a quick fix. It's not something you can learn just overnight and apply. It's going to take a little bit of time. Sure. But at least there's like a heuristic. There is. Yeah. yeah. There is. And by having it with the first six letters of the, the English alphabet, it, it's a very handy mnemonic. Really, just if you can remember A to F and yeah. what all those are, then you can remember how then to apply them. And you know what I mean? It, the mnemonic just trails down like a, like a tree. And then basically... It'll increase the likelihood for us to at least understand the differences between arguments that people might have so that we can better uh, position ourselves to appreciate how have we been biased to believe what we now do. Like, have you ever wondered why Why are there Trumpites at all? Like, why would somebody support this guy that, that we find to be so... Uh, Noam Chomsky was talking about that yeah. this morning on 89.5 on that show, Alternative Radio. Mm -hmm. It comes on at 9 a.m. And he's just talking about, uh, he was discussing how as the center is unfolding and unpacking and dying, the fringe is taking over, which is why on the left you had a Bernie Sanders and on the right you had a Trump. People are disenfranchised, weak, they're so in pain. They're not for the establishment. Mm -hmm. And you know what? If this guy's going to poke at the uh, the opposition and make fun of the opposition, uh, it's all fun and games, but I I trust him more than I mm -hmm. trust what's come before him, which right. is the establishment. So it's the, it's the idea of the anti-establishment, which is more powerful than all the other f facets of that person's mm -hmm. character, regardless. So it's like I'm... I'm forgiving him of his racism. I'm forgiving him of his, his ad hominem attacks. I'm forgiving him of all right. of these other things because you know what? All of those other people that were more center, they're like that, but worse. And that's what <clears throat> that's what the public right. is believing. And, and like uh, the right wing of evangelicals, if you're wondering, how can a Christian support this guy who is so clearly immoral? Yeah. You know what I mean? That broke so many of the Ten Commandments. It's because it's the overall good that they think that party is going to be able to do for their particular value system. Well, Self-interest, of course. Self-interest, yeah. right? He's going to be pro-life. He's going to be for this, yeah. right? He's going to be for that. The pro-life argument's interesting. Like, mm -hmm. I see both sides. Mm -hmm. I see where pro-lifers are going. I see where pro-choice is going. Oh, sure. But then I also view, I look at human behavior and I look at law. There's philosophy, but then there's law. And uh, there's there's no perfect panacea answer for right. this, but how I view it from a pro-choice standpoint, like if you make it or pro-life, if you make it illegal, mm -hmm. no matter what, happen. people are gonna fucking do it. Yeah, man, yeah. that's the problem. No matter it's what, it's gonna happen worse, and, and it could cause irreparable harm. Like you're not gonna stop people. No. Yeah. No. So yeah, like I get where you want. Like you know, I have friends of mine that. They're here because that person didn't get an abortion. They right, were. right. And, you know, it's a miracle that they're yep. here. But exact same time, if somebody wants to do some self-harm damage, like, nothing's stopping them. I know. It's, I kind of look at it like a, you know, it's, it's started a process. Something has started and it's developing. And it's not my call on the process. Because it's not my body. 
Um, in general, I'm not thrilled that a process has to be aborted, which is literally stopping it, right? But I don't know the context. I don't have the nuances. I don't, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not my call in any way, no matter whether I was religious or non-religious, to tell a woman that you have to carry on yeah. for the next nine months. That's yeah. not, that's just not my call, you know? And, you know, we have to realize that it's not a perfect world. We have philosophy. We have Star Trek. What would potentially resolve this? If a woman could take a developing fetus out of herself and give it to a guy and say, here you go, you, you want this to continue? I'll sign off right now. Yeah. Would that change things? Or if it could just stay in a box somewhere? I think, I, mean? I think support <laughs> systems though too. Oh yeah, that's all very important. There's yeah. no question. And birth control, of course, in the preceding stages. This is what Obama talked about when, when it came down to this issue, right? You got to look at the whole aspect of the issue from birth control all the way through mm -hmm. for personal choice and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mom was a Catholic. Mom picketed outside of Henry Morgenthaler's clinics. Henry and I became really good friends. <laughs> 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 I gave the eulogy at Henry's funeral. Oh, you mentioned that last. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so, uh, and and you know what? Even though my mother was a a died in the wool Catholic and hated his guts, mm. I get it. Right? You got to see the consistency of why she would. In her yeah. mind, sperm touches egg. It's God's call. It's not human's call. Yeah. It's a sentient life. Right it there. is. Yeah. And when you take that. You're taking a soul. You're yeah. not just taking a body. You're taking I also, a soul. I, from the scientific standpoint, <clears throat> I don't buy the fact that, how do we definitely know that it's not sentient? At, like, what's the trimester? Like, second or something? Right, right. You so, know what I mean, there seems to be precursive, there's evidence that a precursor for sentience is at least an intact nervous system. So, without a nervous system, there really can't be a form of sentience. So, when does the nerve, nervous system develop? Okay, so very quickly, there's three positions you can have on abortion. Mm -hmm. Conservative. Mm -hmm. Sperm touches egg, that's it. You don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Feminist or legalist, head and shoulders have exited the birth canal. It's alive and it has rights. Mm -hmm. Gradualist, somewhere between sperm and egg and exiting the birth, can birth canal. There's problems with all three. Yep. Right? If it's sperm touches egg... Then I tell people, I have in one hand a 64-celled zygote that's been in liquid nitrogen and is preserved and is viable and can be transferred embryonically into a woman and become a child. And I have a two-month-old. One of these is going to die. You call the shot. Now, if you're a conservative, you have to believe they're equal. Yes. So then you flip a coin. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you don't flip a coin, then that means you might be more of a gradualist than yeah. you thought. Okay. Feminist legalist approach, head and shoulders exiting birth canal. If that's when you believe a, a child is alive, a fetus, a baby, whatever you want to call it, is alive, then let's go back to the point at which the next contraction is going to cause birth. And 10 seconds before that contraction, the woman says, I've decided I don't want this. Inject it with poison and stop its heart now. If you're a legalist feminist, you have to say, do what she just said. Now, if you think it's one more contraction and this thing is coming out fully alive, viable, ready to be adopted or given up for adoption, then maybe you're not fully a legalist feminist. Maybe mm -hmm. you do believe there are times when we really shouldn't be messing mm -hmm. at that point. Now, if you're a gradualist, you got a whole host of problems. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll hold off until the third. Yeah, yeah. This one sounds like an no, easy one. Yeah. I got this one when, covered. <laughs> when is it alive? Yeah. When does it have rights? When it has a fully intact nervous system and the heart beats, when it has all of its organs, when it can respond to pain, when it's conscious. Mm. If it's consciousness, then we can be killing kids up till they're two. Yeah. If we're, if we're really talking about full conscious awareness of themselves... You know, as as Jim Jeffrey said, you know, did you guys believe in late late term abortions? And the woman said, "How late?" He said, "I don't know, five years." Because you're right; it takes a while. It does yeah, right? yeah, like if yeah. you think about it. So, if you're a gradualist, that doesn't make anything easier. Now you have to say the line in the sand is at 17 weeks, 
14 weeks? Yeah. And I've had heads of obstetrics say, <laughs> 14 weeks. What? 14 weeks. I said, what are you talking about? He said, that's my line in the sand. I said, really, you're telling me this right now? And he goes, yep. Because I, I was doing bioethics work at McMaster. Yeah. And I said, that, that's your code, eh? That's it for you. And wow. he said, 14 weeks. What happens at 14? For him, everything's intact. Nervous system, heartbeat, the, the hands. It's pretty much human-like. Yeah. Mm. It's small, but it's pretty much intact. It's not viable. It probably couldn't survive on its own. Yeah. But it's very close. And for him, that was the line in the sand. He was a gradualist, and mm -hmm. he said, that's it. Mm -hmm. He said, no, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop another doctor from doing late-term abortion. That's yeah. not my call. What is late-term? After 20 of, weeks. After so 20, after 20 yeah, weeks. Yeah. I don't know if this is social media fake news, but I've been hearing some crazy stuff about like seven months, eight months, even close to nine months abortion. It's rare. I have no idea. It's Maybe so medical rare. condition. I don't know. They discover something... And, and I've dealt with couples, and this happened. The first two ultrasounds didn't pick it up because the, the fetus hadn't developed enough. The third ultrasound at 19 weeks picked up that there were no lungs. So it's going to be born to die. Yeah. And what could they do? I mean, you either have the abortion then. And some women are like that. I've seen some women say, tomorrow or now. I don't want this fetus to feel any more pain, pain than it yeah. has to. Yeah, yeah. It it would be cruel. And I've had others say, "We're going to term." Yeah. And wow. We're, and we're going to pray. Oh wow. And it's in God's hands now. And as a bioethicist, you don't say, "No, you shouldn't do that." Yeah. You honor that. But this is why I'm more on the side of um, choice. It is choice. Because when you have the law open, you can do A, you can oh, yeah. do B. But what a tough decision oh, they have to it's make. A eh? It's a horrible decision. What a to tough make. decision tough, yeah. they have to make. And now the last thing a bioethicist would ever do is try to convince them to do one thing rather than another. Because context. Yep. They're religious. I'm not overly religious. I'm not yeah. a religious person. I don't get to bring my biases into this. No. Right? For the sake of compassion, you got to listen to the whole person. You got to hear what's going on in their world mm -hmm. and you got to assess the situation accordingly. Uh, because if you don't, then your biases are getting the better of your reasoning, which could inflict harm to their particular worldview and their value system. Yeah. So no easy answers no. in ethics. I had a friend of mine that was born dead. Really? Yeah. And the mother wouldn't let him go and she held on to him and held on to him and held on to him and he, he resuscitated. Yeah, they say it must have been the mother's touch or the heartbeat of the mother yeah. or something like that. Some, yeah. you know, stuff. But yeah, he's. Oh yeah, it's a tough. He's alive today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, and we're never going to solve the abortion issue. Like nobody's ever going to come up with a magical argument that says, "Aha, here's the answer." Yeah, we're not because we just differ so much in our in our opinions about what it means to be alive and therefore have rights as an individual. Well, the, the, the most important thing though is you, you make optionality. Like I always give the argument against like hardcore socialists. I'm like, you can be a socialist here in a, in a not really capitalist system, but semi-capitalist mm -hmm. system. I cannot be a capitalist in your system. Mm. I can't. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad ran away from Yugoslavia because the government came in and took his business. Right. And that's why he came to Canada. Exactly. You can still run your business, sure. Yeah. But under our rules exactly. and we have our fingers. Under new government. management. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That's wild. It is. Think about it. Right? So what, you got to create systems that everyone can play in. You want your answer or your choice? Here yeah. you go. You want your choice? Here you go. And those are truly the greatest countries to live in. Yes. Right? The ones that people are highly educated. They have maximum amount of freedom. They have social programs that take care of those less fortunate. Mm -hmm. And that people give a damn. Like they, they, you know, when I was in Iceland, I'd see people on the street walk, walk past garbage cans where there might be a bottle at the bottom, they go and get it and put it in the garbage can. They don't let the next person do it. Yeah. When we had to use the gym, uh, the group before us, it was like five minutes before we went on, a bell rings. They all stop what they're doing and like six of them grab uh, mops and form a line and sweep the gym floor. And then we get it for an hour yeah. and five minutes before, something that the Bell rings, and then we decide six of it, and then we do it for the next. So it's that's like a social democracy. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, but there's, there's, you know, you look at these places as very homogenous, mm -hmm. very low population. Well, Iceland's like, like less than 400. Yeah. 000. And they have a unique identity that they can all raise their hands and say, like, for example, Toronto, I love Toronto as a city. I don't consider myself a Torontonian, mm -hmm. and I don't know what a Toronto identity is. Right. Like what? What's I've been saying this for like, a long time from a, a branding perspective. Yeah, if you were to stop a hundred people and ask, "What does this city represent?" Actually, they're going to say diversity because it's the easiest. Like it's the easy one to to pull down. Sure. But really and truly, like, what is our vision? What is our identity? What is our brand? It's undefined, really. So there's no cohesive unity, right? Right. That's the thing. When people talk about like, oh, and it's it's very tribal. It's like you're not mm -hmm. gonna like everybody. You're not gonna agree with everybody. That's it. And uh, yeah, here's a good segue for that. Saying we are all African got my ass fired. Yeah, you mentioned that last time. Yeah, but if we could accept that and understand that we're all related, mm -hmm. can this go? Any distance towards reducing the racism and the hatred of the other? I know we're tribal, you know? Tribalism exists. So about to say racism that. doesn't exist. Yeah. Right. Well, racism are we actually racist or are we just no. tribal? Because now yeah. we're xenophobic, which is yeah. fear of the foreigner. Correct. Fear of that which is fear foreign of the to unknown. Us. Yeah. I just Any recently. Unknown. So we're xenophobic. Yeah. But just, all animals are. Oh, yeah. yeah. They have to be. They end up as lunch. Yeah, if it's safety not. precautions. Yeah. It's like, I don't know who yeah. you are. Back That's off. right. Yeah. But once we get trust, right? Once we know that I don't have to fear you anymore. That's got to go. The fear's got to go, right? Because what what reason now do you have? So here now, how long do you think it'll be before the world accepts that we are all African? Or do you think it's going to be uh, centuries? Uh, actually? Yeah. Never in my mind. Really? Eh? You don't think there will be a world acceptance that we all came from the same place and that we're all related? This is where like my belief in like you, one, the prophet Gene Roddenberry comes in. And, yeah. I, I, and I'm almost religious in my belief in Star Trek where I say, you know what? Like, I believe, I, I got to believe, man, that it's going it, to, it's possible. I got to believe that we're going to get to that point of like Roddenberry level of enlightenment. Not None of this new shit. Uh, Star Trek, but like, I, I think Picard level. Hmm. The only way that's going to happen, I mentioned before, is there has to be a global catastrophe. The aliens or something's going to kill us all. We need an enemy that we can unite together that benefits all of us. Right. The Watchmen. Yeah, sure. Uh, Another thing, though, too, is like you mentioned Africa. You know, obviously, religious people should kind of be on that side if there was an Adam and Eve, right? We yeah. all should be theoretically come sure. from these, some of my Christian friends believe that's yeah, where the male garden or female, right? Was, yeah. And uh, whether it's uh, Africa or like you, you replace Africa for like I don't know like any country, like, Scarborough, Scarborough, like everyone comes from Scarborough, like one point <laughs> we're all Scar, that's right, we're all Scarborians, one point of origins, let's say, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I think the the identities and philosophies and egos are too ingrained in people. Mm. And I think you mentioned transhumanism. I think in the future, you mentioned Star Trek, we will have a new subspecies of Homo sapiens who are genetically modified from the get-go using CRISPR or any right. type of new technology. Cas9. Correct. They're no longer Homo sapien. They're mm. next version. So they won't even agree that we I come from there. There I'm, is a TED talk on this. I'm brand have I'm a brand it? new type of human being. No. That our our grandchildren are gonna be a different species pretty much. Like the, mm. the, the rate of change, especially in, in the brain and like the level of autism in the last little while, more more humans are like geared to specialize that uh, a few generations from now we're gonna be very, very different. But it's not I'm gonna find I'm gonna find that I'm literally talking about, about using technology to say how do I create this person be more myelin in the brain. How do I create? Right. So yeah, yeah. Using whether it's like a delivery system by virus or in bacteria, mm -hmm. I will uh, genetically modify an egg and a sperm, and I can maybe will have certain chambers to semi mimic a womb mm -hmm. to a certain level. Then maybe we can put it into a, a, a host. Mm -hmm. This is a brand new human. It is brand new human. And so for them, their identity is like, 
well, mm-hmm. I'm not from Africa. I'm not naturally conceived. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm genetically modified human being. Mm-hmm. Well, theoretically, then you could make androids, right? If you could model that process. I think we're eventually going to get there. Mm-hmm. We've already seen people like in China, they've uh, used CRISPR for HIV to cut it out. Oh, shit, really? You got to be careful with the CRISPR because what you really? cut out, you don't know what the long term effects might be. Second so, order thinking. I yeah, always mention that. We're not there yet. Right, we're yeah. close. Yeah. But guys are doing it themselves, eh? Some guys well, do it in garage. Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Biohacking. Yeah, yeah. It's huge. You can, I, I know of biohacking. I didn't know you could do that. He injected it so that it would turn his, his, uh, his muscle. Like he didn't have to work out as much. It would convert, tear his muscle down and build it up quicker. And he died, I think. Yeah, that's my thing with any new CRISPR technology. CRISPR-Cas9, it's called. Yeah, oh, that, that's the thing with any new technology is you want to wait to like 10th generation yeah. or something. That's like, especially when you're like yeah. snipping my RNA with some bacteria. That's yeah, it's wild. like DVD players. Let's just wait. Yeah. You're $1,000 now. <laughs> Let's just uh, I found just the uh, the name of that TED Talk. There's actually two by the same gentleman. His name is Juan, uh, J-U-A-N, yeah. Enrique. And uh, one of the TED Talks is called Will Our Kids Be a Different Species? And then the other one is The Next Species of Humans. Yeah. Yeah. So like with me- going back to Star Trek and the hope that humans will unite, mm-hmm. the only way, like I said, the only way I see it is we have to have some kind of external. So calamity. In yeah. Roddenberry, it was World War III. And World War III was a, uh, the war of uh, social, uh, it was a social war of different uh, classes. Because the, I mean, think about it, man. This guy has started writing this shit in the 60s, right? Oh, yeah. But basically, uh, sometime in, in this period, in the mid uh, 21st century, uh, the, uh, the classes are so far apart. And the, it starts actually in San Francisco. This is bizarre. In California and in San Francisco. Doesn't everything and LA. start in California? And the, the divide is so huge that eventually, like, that's what creates a global really? world war. Yeah. And after that. The haves and the have nots? The haves and the have nots. Okay. There's a pretty much a <clears throat> decomposition of like gov- government agencies and world leaders and everything. And then they kind of got to rise back up. And at this point, they've now matured to work together. Hmm. I wonder if there's any kind of, we know there's a correlation, but I wonder if there's any causal relationship between the erosion of the middle class and the erosion of the, the middle po- poli- you know, politico. Mm-hmm. Where we oh, have interesting, yeah. Such a strong diversity on both ends now and such an erosion of that middle class. If, if any society has a nice fat middle class, everybody tends to be pretty happy. I think this is what Chomsky was saying is that that is exactly what's happening. There's more oh, yeah? and more people that are disenfranchised. Because uh, he started it off with discussing um, uh, with the wealth distribution and how most people are actually in debt. Like the majority yeah, of the Americans for are, sure. are way the in The problem the is they do the blame game. And yeah, I like one, people have to understand that we're not in a capitalist system. We're in, we're in a, a crony capitalism. Like the stuff that Wall Street does is fucked up. Like they're beyond criminal. The bailouts that they did, the free money that they got, the buybacks of stocks that they're doing. Just, that's straight just the fucking competition criminal. alone now, right? Yeah. It's all algorithmic. It's high yeah. frequency trading. But even getting bailed out by the fucking government. Yeah. And then and then getting buying, bonuses. bonuses. Too big to fail. <laughs> right? And then buying back your own stocks with free money that you yeah. have. Too big to fail. You know, fail. It's, it's called the Catalina effect too. They get the first money, so they have a premium on the money. They spend on what they want, and it trickles down to the rest of the people mm. at a high inflated rate. Yeah. Well, see, at least Iceland went after those guys and put them in jail. Yeah. So good on them. So for me, when I look at like the middle class, I think they've also been sold, well, not just middle class, just for everybody. They've been sold a bullshit dream. Yeah, we're not actually capitalistic. You know, we have- Especially in the States. We're, it's not, and that's the problem. There's too, there's too much lobbying going on. There's too much, like, uh, I don't remember where I was reading it, but basically, as soon as you get into office as a senator, you're spending four or five hours a day, you're saying, getting prepared to meet donors. Like most of your job is to to collect money yeah. from from big donors. Yeah, it's not to serve the people. Yeah, and it's just like this. You saw you saw Edward Snowden's talk, right, on Joe Rogan. I didn't watch the full three hours. No, I watched a bit of it. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. He 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 mentioned how presidents will come in with all of these ideas, and within their first day, they'll sit down with the career politicians, the people running the FBI, the CIA, guys who've been around for a very long time. This is great. 
love your ideas. Here's the reality of the situation. This is what the fuck you're doing. Yeah. And you're just like in that same. You're caught in, the, yeah. in that system. Which I will, I will give, like, I'll throw a little bit of credit in Trump's direction. It's very suspicious that Trump's personality is he doesn't like getting bullied. He likes to be the bully. Mm-hmm. First thing he did was he got into a big fight with the CIA and the FBI. And then it wasn't until recently with this Edward Snowden uh, conversation that I was like, that's very, very interesting. Have we seen, and I'm too young, but have we seen ever in the history of United States another president being attacked by so many people? There was <clears throat> not a president, but a candidate, Barry Goldwater. And the American Psychiatric Association, the APA, came out against him. Mm. That's why it's called the Goldwater effect that you can't psychologically analyze a person without af- actually having met them and discussed their situation and whatnot. Remember people were saying Trump's a narcissist. So, yeah. You know, he he could be uh, could be a psychopath. Yeah. Um, so it was known as this kind of Goldwater aspect that we, we did it with Barry Goldwater and he lost big time, mm-hmm. you know, because it was like he's unstable. He's mentally unstable. And they were saying the same thing about Trump when he took over office and then they changed their tune and said, no, we now have more than enough evidence to know for sure he's a narcissist. Yeah. Not all narcissists are psychopaths, but every psychopath is a narcissist. A narcissist. So is he, a, does he suffer from psychopathy? It's possible. That's actually a really good topic we should talk about. If we find out that the psychopaths, and psychopaths can be made, they don't necessarily all have to have a genetic component, but we well, know they're predisposed. That, we know there is a, a strong biological yeah. component. So if we can make that determination early enough in life, sh- do we owe it to society and to that individual? Then how do we, it befalls us, how then do we treat that individual? Right? You know, some people maintain, well, you just put a bullet behind their ear and you take them out. You take them out of the gene pool because we can't have psychopaths because by and large, the psychopaths are making the world shitty for I don't everybody buy that. else. I, I, so that's interesting. Like, um, uh, you see that recent Netflix documentary on Bikram Yoga? yoga? Mm-hmm. You saw that, right? Mm-hmm. Good uh, documentary. Good documentary. This guy was clearly a psychopath. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. But the red flags swiddled. are there from day one. Oh, I you know. you got to be a but, moron not to see the fucking... Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. From day one, he was like, I'm the best. I've created yoga, pretty much. Like, this guy was... But you know what? Yeah. As fucked up as he was, and this is what... Uh, uh, I hope I'm not like butchering one of the lessons I learned here from Sapiens. Like we don't know the long term no. impact of of the decisions and of the people. That's right. Hundreds of years from now, we're gonna be like, remember that guy Bikram Yoga that, that did? The, he was the person that brought yoga into North America and the Western Hemisphere. My thinking is these human traits or archetypical mm-hmm. designs have been here from the get go. Right. From like basic logical thinking, they must serve a purpose in this so-called tribal mm-hmm. system that we had or still have. The question they're is, they're the sneaky fuckers. <laughs> well, they're the ones who lack empathy, right? They're there has the to ones... be a, there has to be some reason. It could be a mutation. Exist, yeah. It could be just a basic mutation. And like wartime, do we need them in wartime efforts? Them, maybe Churchill was a psychopath. Right? There's that right? Aboriginal saying, right? You need wartime leaders and peacetime leaders. Yeah. Right? There's That's two right. different types of leaders. Yeah. Churchill was a great war leader yeah but not a good peacetime leader leader. yeah man i know a few people that i can say you know you you don't want to invite them to your daughter's birthday but shit if there is a apocalypse i'd be going to homie's home (laughs) i'd be hanging out with that guy you also gotta look at like people like you talk about politics and there are i would say a very few that have altruistic reasons to go Mm -hmm. let's say a few but the majority, they go for their own self-interest. They want to dictate their point of view right. onto you. That's it. Kind of the opposite of what the Greeks had in mind. With yeah, like that's it. Like there's no other reason. Mm-hmm. You want to do better for society? I can tell you 10 things on top of my head that you can do right now to have a change today mm-hmm. then go to into politics. Mm. But I want to go in politics. Well, this is another problem. You've got a lot of really intelligent people. You've got a lot of great people who don't go into politics as well. You've got a lot of great people who don't go into teaching because it sucks. Yeah. Uh, think, of, think of all the people who have beautiful, 
checkered backgrounds. Yeah. That could be great politicians. But you know what? They're like, why would I expose myself? Mm -hmm. Why would I go into that arena and but they also have don't my have, personal life picked apart but they because also don't I'm not have the, that per perfect person. But they don't have that default natural behavior of like, I want to put my fucking fist down right. and be like, this is how I want it done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to be wired a certain way to succeed in politics. Yeah. Thomas Hobbes said it's probably better to work with one individual, even if that individual is a tyrant because you can know what to expect. Tony cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> Rather than a board. Yeah. Because with the board, there's going to be in, you know, backstabbing and, you know, behind the scenes crap that goes on. And I, th like I think another way for society to become better is I had one of the top candidates for the Libertarian Party a couple of nights ago here, Keith. And uh, uh, the Ontario Libertarian Party's first um, uh, uh, modus operandi is like the number one thing they would do is every single, they will itemize every single balance sheet of the federal government. Mm -hmm. it's God like, bless them. We, we want to know, okay, we're not going to change taxes, right? We can, that's a different conversation. Right. We want to know where the fuck is the money going? Yeah. Yeah. I'm shocked that in yeah. today's day and age with the systems we have in place that I as a citizen can't go on a government website and know exactly, just like yeah, I would as a shareholder in a company. Yeah. yeah P and L exactly and everything. <laughs> where the pennies go. To me, it makes no sense for an organization to continuously be in the red. Mm -hmm. How could you keep being in the red? Does Toronto lack like uh, intellectual horsepower? Is the economy gone to shit? Like mm -hmm. we're supposed to be in a booming time, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's supposed it to has to be transparent. If people yeah. If, if if the governments want to yeah, that should be the first. If governments step. want to avoid big trouble in the future, and cycles repeat, people get fed up. You know, they have a low quality of living. They're like, "Yo, enough's enough." We we want to build a more trusted society. A trusted society is a healthy society. It's a unified society. We need transparency. So does that mean we got to get rid of lobby, lobbying? lobbying. Oh man, should we lobbying have to at least limit mess. limit it? Limit it. Socrates said, "If you want a democracy, those who lead, yeah, within the democracy." Go into office with the clothes on their back. Yes. Yep. We'll pay for your food and your housing. Yeah. We'll take care I of your agree. family. Yeah. But you cannot gain by this position. You I are there to serve the polis. Yeah. Well, even you, sh you shouldn't be coming out of politics with millions more. No. no. That makes no but sense. That's the thing they said with Trump right now. That's exactly job. opposite to what the Greeks defined yeah. as yeah. democracy. And yeah. I'll tell you, there are going to be way more altruistic people who will say, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I don't want the money. I yep. don't need the power. I'm going to do it to, to, to prove a point. These are angels of our better nature. These yeah. are the people we need leading, lead, you know, driving the ship. That's Pinker's book, right? Yeah. yeah. So, Absolutely. government transparency. Yeah. I want to. I want to bring up a little bit about the idea of right to bear arms in the United States. Yes. And then contrast that to what's happening in Iran and Hong Kong. Okay. Sure. sure. So, where do you want to start? Would the things that are happening in Iran? in Hong Kong be happening if all of those people were fucking armed to the teeth? I don't think so. Yeah, so when I hear- and I think this is what the Americans know, which is why they're paranoid about their government. Yeah, I think it would still be happening. It'll be different dynamics and- uh, It would be civil war, it would be different. Yeah. But the government would be a lot more careful in stepping in and yep. going in because yeah. they would know that a civil well, war- Well, I give a classic up. example, like uh, Yugoslavian war technically started 89 and broke in the 90s. But what people don't realize in the mid '80s, it had started campaigning to de-arm mm. citizens. So really, Bosnia, Croatia, yada yada yada, all the countries. Yeah. So they were taking away guns. Yeah, you're left for like a pistol. The fucking do with a pistol. You know, I mean nothing. Yeah. You know, what's a pistol going to do against a tank and RPGs, right? Right. But like people you, had their own militia. Rifles. Like everyone was army. Everyone's trained. It was mandatory military service. So everyone had the mental fortitude and physical and mental skills to use. My mom can take a part of a gun and do everything. Like, right. She's yeah. fully trained in the army. But your wife is Viet Vietnamese. She's Vietnamese. And didn't Vietnam win largely because the farmers were just so adept at knowing how to set traps and figuring they, things out. They, they weren't had, armed to the teeth. They, yeah, they, but they were also savvy. The, they had the help of the Russians. Also. They did. Yeah. They had a, they had a um, motto, grab them by the belt, because they realized that you know they, they couldn't fight the war a long range. Right. They would have to get so close. Yeah, it's guerrilla warfare. Grab them yeah. by the belt. Yeah, yeah it's because and, the and Americans unfamiliar had no way to do warfare. Unfamiliar, like yeah. Jungle warfare yeah. scared yeah. the hell out of them. They didn't know where. Like, they for my was. view on guns, 
Have you seen the documentary? It's on Netflix, the um, Vietnam Ken, War. Ken Burns? Oh, it's yeah. brutal, man. I know. Yeah. It's like hard to hold back. You gotta look, you, when people say government gives you rights, I'm like, what is a laughing joke? Mm -hmm. As a sovereign human being, you're born with rights. Mm -hmm. you're, you're born with what you want to, uh, your religious uh, viewpoints, you're born with freedom of speech, you're mm -hmm. born with the sovereign right to defend yourself as a human being. The whole notion that government can grant grant me rights. You're granting me so I can think. Right. You're granting me so I can protect my family from crazy people. So these are like natural rights. Natural rights. Yeah. Born natural. And I and I and I overlay it to nature. You have two chimp tribes, and in nature, and this is why dogs behave a certain way. There's something called resource guarding, right? I got to guard the females. Very important resource, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I got to uh, guard my food. And so the next tribe of chimps come around. What's going to happen? They fight, but they use tools. Chimps have tools, animals have tools, they use it. So they, they are given their natural right to defend their territory against mm -hmm. invaders. Mm -hmm. Here the government comes around like, no, 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 no. We don't give you any rights. You can't defend yourself. You have to rely on us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think it's a, it's a natural sovereign right for you have the ability. And now, how you attain the gun mm -hmm. is a different conversation. That's a different conversation. You don't have to... Just because you believe in the right to bear arms doesn't mean you believe in the right to be able to walk I, into I, a Walmart well, and just I pick up. I always fuck with people's mind. I mean, yeah. you realize more people die from car accidents than any guns. Like, yep. yeah. that's, a, that's the most dangerous weapon I see. And yep. yet we still have <clears throat> more training to get a car than we have to buy a gun. Canada's a little bit more. Right. Uh, yeah. no, the, Canadian gun owners. Are, <coughs> on the way in today, great. I heard a uh, report on, on CBC Radio. When I go through the States <clears throat> on tour, wherever I'm going, I usually go to a gun shop. Yeah. And I rent whatever model I want, depending on what mood I'm in, go into their range, blast off 60 rounds, whatever, yeah. take my little target and ski daddle. And every time I go into one, I ask, why would I need a handgun? And the reaction is almost always the same. Personal protection. What they said on the study from the CBC this morning, less than 1% of people pull their guns for personal protection when a crisis occurs, like a mass shooting or things like that. Yeah. So then it's not really for personal protection. It's, it's out of fear of what might or could happen. It's fear of what might could happen, but also the fact that you're not pro – like there's a massive difference when someone like let's say has gone through military training. Yes. And yeah. actual, first, it's the mental That's right. fortitude. You pick up the gun, you know someone's well, going to shoot. Well, you've been there. Like, I, I, did, I did Krav Maga for a year and a half every single day. I do. I like to pick up a new thing every year. And like, it's not the fact, cool, anyone can learn techniques as arm and knife or a gun and all that. That's not the benefit. The benefit is having the mental fortitude mm -hmm. and you've repeated this pattern before. So when I'm yeah. in this situation, I'm not panicking. Mm -hmm. I've been here before. It's muscle I, memory. Muscle memory. So it's like... Yeah. Uh, the famous uh, Korean thing, what's it called? Uh, OODA loop, observe, direct, orient. So I'm observing the situation. I'm, I'm analyzing what's going on. Mm -hmm. I'm making my action plans in my mind. Then I'm, I'm going towards it. The problem with somebody like, let's say, you know, I'm an American. So I don't know how easy I heard it's pretty damn easy to get a gun. You walk into Walmart, wherever you grab a pistol, nine millimeter or something. And you have like, you know, whatever, nine rounds, how many rounds mm -hmm. comes in. What training do you have? I know. Yeah, first time shooting a gun, I was shocked. First time hearing a gun, yeah. I was shocked at how loud it was. That's why I first said first time that shooting a group. rifle. Yeah, bing. That was with yeah. the fact Switzerland's that Switzerland's a, a good example. You have the most armed nation per capita based on their population, but everyone went to the military. Mm -hmm. It's trained. You have to have training. Yeah, like when we when I said we should go shooting, like uh, the group. Yeah. Um, before we go, if if there are those who have never shot before. I'll give them a little tutorial about what to expect because that's usually the biggest freak yeah. show. It's the kick, eh? You don't expect the kick. I'm not a flincher, eh? Yeah. Because uh, in, in video games, you know, you see that, but you don't feel it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you going know. back to Hong Kong, like you would have a group of people that have guns if it was based on the American model of just getting it that have no expertise, mm -hmm. no knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's, there's a big difference. If... We'd also have to assume that if there there was a culture of having guns, you would have a lot more people going to gun ranges and having a little bit more expertise. Oh, you'd, you'd think. You'd think. Yeah. 
you think it's one thing to go to a gun range is different to be prepared in situations much different but would arming the iranians and uh nationals in hong kong make it better or make it worse short run long run i don't know it's gonna make it more deadly it'd make it more deadly well, i'm, let's I'm stop it, it would, sooner it would it would probably i'm talking out of my ass here but it would probably prevent it from starting almost like a nuclear arms race. Oh. you have two factions that, that neither don't is, really want this to happen nobody yeah. wants it to happen when you know that a percentage 10 percent even of your population is armed to the teeth just 10 percent you got to think twice about like getting a little too aggressive with those with those peaceful protesters right because you're going to be like you know what somebody in that peaceful protest is armed that's not going to be so peaceful so was it a huge mistake for beto o'rourke to say we're coming for your assault rifles do you remember when he said that mm -hmm. yeah like you can't say that in i the think States. Are you out of your mind if they ever really try to take away guns it'd be all it's all never hell just it won't happen it's, man. it shouldn't even be on the table yeah it shouldn't even be on the table yeah the genie's out of the bottle yeah we got to deal with it yeah all right. Education. Education. What's the better best licensing? Day? Background checks. We have to be vigilant about this. And we have to get the NRA on board. Like those guys, man, they're pretty screwed from within now. Eh? They're, they're imploding. Oh, yeah. What's happening? Infighting with what's his name? Lapierre, whatever yeah. his name is. Ah, really? Money being spent. He's, he's making it rain, man. He's <laughs> taking a lot of money from the NRA on yeah, suits sure. and flights and whatnot. So, and did you know the NRA has no computer? system what it's all paper really on purpose wow. on purpose oh wow no computer logs it's crazy. battlestar galactica buddy all yeah. paper so it takes a long time to get anything done there but they have so much money they're such a powerful <laughs> lobby group yeah you know and it's unfortunate so they don't send emails i was a huge fan of the nra when i was like 14 yeah. 13 and whatnot because they were doing good work they were educating people they were all for background check. They were nothing like they are now. Like, well, so is the Republican and Democrat Party. Yeah, exactly. Nothing like the way they are now. And that's unfortunate because if you look at uh, Switzerland, Sweden, different countries of the world, they have guns too. I tell you, Switzerland has more per capita. Per than, capita. Yeah, yeah, more. But yet they don't have near the shooting. Exactly. It's not a gun thing. No. Yeah, well, Canada has a lot of gun owners. When we were doing research on really? this. Really? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. It's surprising how many people yeah. in yep. Canada own guns. How difficult it is to get a gun here? Well, you have to get your pal. You've got to get your what's yeah. the old, the new version of the firearm. And there's a difference between having a gun and having a hunting rifle. No, well, there's no. If you want to hunt, of guns. yeah. If you want to hunt, that's a different story. There's long rifle, yeah, long gun. And then if you want to go pistol or assault, assault, that's specialized. Assault's too easy to hunt. I want. So I want if you just challenge. want your rifle, yeah, it's one day course. Okay. If you want your pistol. Another day, mm. you got to add. I love guns. Mm -hmm. Love them. Always have. When I was 14, I could take apart a 45 automatic and put it back together in nice. less than a minute. Thought I would be a gunsmith. Mm -hmm. Thought, <laughs> really? Yeah. That's how much you love guns. Thought I would be a sniper, like uh, go into the army, yeah. be a sniper, then come out, come to Toronto, join the SWAT team and be, oh, know, wow. be a sharpshooter. Because I was, I was good. Yeah. Um. As much as I love guns, and I love guns, and I love firing them, and target shooting, I'll never have one in my home ever. Interesting. Ever. Even in like a, a even if I move to the states yeah. or doesn't matter, I'm not going to have one. If I'm in Somalia and we have to go somewhere, I'm packing. Yeah. Here, you know, but that's because I might be assaulted by you know yeah pirates or whomever. But no, in Canada, the U.S., Europe, places like that. I'll keep them at the gun club. I'll go to the gun club. I'll sign it out. I'll target practice and I will put it back. Mm -hmm. if, you don't need to have it in your house, no, really. Do you know the majority of gun deaths in the States? More than 50%? Suicide. That's it. Really? Yeah. And if we just didn't have them in the home, how many of those people would still be alive right now getting the treatment they needed? Well, even before that, how did they yeah. get it in the first place? Mental health check for sure. Yeah, yeah there exactly. There has to be. But you see, when you're pissed off because your wife's banging the delivery guy or pizza, whatnot pizza, yeah guy. you know like for example you get epilepsy you can't drive here yeah or you want to show somebody you, you know, know what i mean like you shouldn't be able to have a gun if you're having fucking seizures exactly but it's it's the immediacy of of 
reaction. So in Canada, female suicides, poison, number one. Poison. Men? I don't know. Jumping? Hang, hanging. Mm. Old school. Lynching. Fuck. If we had guns, guys, yeah. especially handguns, that number is going to go up. I mean, this, the evidence is clear on this. Yeah. That, yeah. You know, we, we know. It's going to take a, a while for me to figure out how to do a fucking news. It's got to watch on YouTube. Somebody's going to get flagged. <laughs> before, and what, a bad what are way, you doing, honey? What like, a bad way to die. Listen, there's yeah. a, is if a, you like, do it wrong. Is it a bad way to die? If you don't do it right, like uh, Saddam Hussein. Yeah. His head was ripped off. Really? Because they didn't do it right. Oh. Yeah. Not good. Like out of the body? And hanging like with the blood just like it was a horrible death. Oh, shit. Because they did. You got to. It's a science to yeah. hanging. You, yeah, it's yeah. a weight ratio. Yeah, yeah. Hangmen back in the 1800s, you know, yeah, they yeah. knew their job. They built the gallows. They tested the gallows. They knew the weight of the guy who was about to be hanged. They made the length at which it breaks his neck, C3 and C4. Everything was calculated. The hangman was a profession. Interesting. You had to know how to do this humanely. They're now thinking of bringing the guillotine back. They think it's what? far more humane. The guillotine? Far more humane. Than what? Drugs? Drugs. What? Guys on death row. So yeah. Italy supplies some of the, the drugs. The drugs, right? yeah. And, and, and in Italy, they're saying to the states... There's a shortage. Uh, we'll try to get you that next month because they're doing it for compassionate reasons. They yeah. know why the drug's being ordered, right? Yeah. Got it. So then the states are just saying, well, substitute this then. And the one guy, you can look this up. Oh, the one oh, guy, fuck. they botched it so bad. Yeah. It induced a heart attack and he died for over an hour what? because of a massive heart attack that they wouldn't treat him for to bring him back to then kill him. And they tried to chop his head off with a no, guillotine? No, no, no. No. The guillotine... <laughs> There ain't no coming back, okay, brother. Okay, I was about to say, did no. it only go halfway? Did no. they forget to sharpen the blade? The guillotine, many are considering, is a more humane what? Really? way of then dying. Well, if you think about it, your it's neck's chopped off, done. You don't feel a thing, and you're never coming back. Hanging, not good. Electrocution's one of the worst. Yeah, that's yeah that cold, one seems man. horrible. That's it's horrific. Fuck. I'm shocked they do that, man. Now, that's here's the you, deal with the, the uh, death by injection. I hear that's pretty bad, too. And how they screw really? that up. Yeah. John you know, Hostis. Like fucking heart attack, shit fuck. yourself. The guy who, who was doing the assistance in death before it was legal yeah, in Canada. Yeah, yeah. You know what his technique was? What? And it never failed. Yeah. Roofies and helium. So why the fuck they didn't do that then? Roofies and helium. That's it? Just roofies, you start to fade. Yeah. You go into a state of kind of bliss. They're bag true. over the head. Yeah. Helium for one minute. Bag off. They're done. Really? They're done. Wow. Eight deaths he did that by that way. Never had a complication for any of them. Now, I'm not saying there isn't or yeah. couldn't be. Well, but if he could have done that than... and he figured that out on his own. By the way, I'm not sure if I should say this or not. It's becoming a very popular way for kids to die, right? There's a helium shortage in the world. Right? Globally, yeah. Massive yeah, one. I've heard. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this hits home because a good friend of mine, that's how his son took his life with helium and it's online you can find you can find out how to do it easily enough online but these these convicts like first of all there should if we want to jump into that category there should be no death penalty i was going to bring that up there should yeah. just be no death penalty yeah we need to figure out why somebody would co commit such atrocious acts against others and try to figure that out keep them from harming anybody else for sure but what's going on in the machinery? What broke down in the machinery that caused this person to act in such a horrific manner towards others? Yeah. Yeah. Can they be salvaged? Is redemption possible for a mass murderer? Can uh, Paul Bernardo be redeemed? Could mm. uh, Son of Sam? Well, it goes back to Ted Bundy. It's less about the government and more about the intelligence and consciousness of the people in the public who have to grow and mature as a civilization, we're still immature, yeah. a lot of us, as oh, very people, much. as a society. Bring, if we were more mature, Bundy, we would right? say, you know what? I don't need this person's life yeah. to go to avenge my child. Yeah. What would be better for my child is if, now that this person's caught, right. if they can be rehabilitated. Like the Humboldt tragedy. It's not about even right? rehabilitating, as Chris said, it's figuring out why. Like, for example, with Ted Bundy, like, he would have sex with dead corpses. Yes. He so was, for, for me, like, his that's why. For me, his actions were like, oh, I wasn't like, oh, wow, he really, he thought this out and he chose to do this. I'm like, no, 
the urge was so great. Oh, the machine's broken. Yeah, yeah. Some the yeah. urge was so great yeah. in this yeah. human being that he had to do it. Yeah. And so for me, I, I'm thinking like, whoa. What's, wow. what's wrong with the OS? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm like, what the fuck's going on in his head that no matter what, he's going to do this. And nothing's topping it more than killing, eh? Like when you talk to these yeah. serial killers yeah. and you find out it's like, there's nothing like killing. Because you got to, like even planning it. and then Like he had that VW with the seat that went all the way yeah. back. <laughs> do you remember uh, Silence of the Lambs? Oh, a long time ago. Oh, yeah. But he's got the cast on and he's trying to get the couch into the back of his van. Mm -hmm. And that girl sees him and she goes over to offer him help. Mm -hmm. And he makes her get on the one end that goes in the van first. Yes. And then he uses the cast to knock to her knock out. To knock her out, That's yeah. That's Ted Bundy, dude. That's yeah. exactly his MO. That's, and he was a pretty boy. He was. So yeah. women That's would right. Think, he was a good looking guy. Serial killers aren't this good looking. Yeah. He's trustworthy and he's knowledgeable and he's kind. And oh, look, he has his arm in a sling. How threatening can that be? Well, he did that purposefully to, yeah. to get their defenses down, to make them more vulnerable. So, but what about the humble? You remember the humble tragedy, right? Truck goes through a stop sign, hits that bus, kills, oh, kills all those a, yeah, 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 yeah. hockey kids and whatnot. That was recently, it was on so the So what again, should yeah. we do with him? He yeah. got eight years, I think, right? He got eight years. Eh? What's his life Was he drunk like? or what was no. his situation? Why did he get More, eight years? Well, nobody knows Nobody knows. Sure. He ran the, yeah. Why do you go through a stop sign? Yeah. Sleep deprivation, you're on that thing. Oh, man. Could be something. You give him eight years, eh? But is that going to help him? Like, surely his life must be over. Like, in it's terms done. of, I just took how many lives? Yeah, because I, I fucked up big yeah. time, right? I yeah. messed up. So I give this talk rede about redemption. Can he be redeemed? And if he can be redeemed, what do we owe it to him as a human being to try to bring him back into humanity? You know, clearly he knows what he did was wrong mm -hmm. and atrocious. And, but to put him in jail for what? What's he going to do rotting in a cell? It's right? like these sc what scenarios is, where these young parents, like a mother, doesn't pay attention to their daughter or their child. Their child passes away. They're going through the grief of that, and then the state throws them in prison yeah. as well. It's like, really? Yeah. So the justice system definitely needs reform. Yeah. Like, like nobody's Ideally, in my altruistic future, there is no prisons. Hmm. In my Star Trek future, I think. Do you remember... Um, well, yeah, in, in Star Trek, there are prisons, but the prisons don't look anything like they do today. The, the best prisons prison are very much like, remember that? Um, I saw, you see this prison in Scandinavia? Moore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Scandinavia. So you're living prisons. in a house. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, Michael Moore did a thing on this uh, years ago, yeah. like a film. The problem with the prison system in where North they went America to, is privatized. Where they you, went have, to, you, have, you have prisons even on the stock market in, in the United oh, States. Yeah. It's so fucked. It's fucked up when you're making yeah. money. Yeah. Um, I think it was Norway or something. Norway, I think you're where, right. Yeah. Uh, they were on an island together, all of these criminals, but it was like this really pimped out Airbnb cottage. And yeah. they interviewed this one guy who was out in the forest, who's chopping trees for, for uh, firewood. They asked him, what did he do to deserve to come here? And he's like, well, I, uh, I committed a murder. <laughs> He had committed a murder with an axe, <laughs> out of all things. But the, the here's the thing: there's a boat. Yeah, there's a boat. There's no like guards. They can get on the boat and go back at any time to the regular like to the city, but they don't. It's different. Hmm. Dostoevsky said, "You can judge a society by its prisons." Mm. And what that means is, how well do we treat those who break the rules? That shows a level of civility within us. You have to understand all of the biases that have contributed to an individual's life to make them commit an act that defies and goes against the rules that you have put as the highest values in society. All right. Why? What points of causality have led that person? You know, and so many of these these crimes are acts of passion, whereas if they had had more time yes. to have thought about it, same yeah. with suicide, they'd yeah, yeah. never have done it. Yep. So then we want to ruin a person's life by saying, yeah, you, you messed up. You messed up. So we're going to put you away. Now, if a person is truly dangerous, they're a harm to themselves or others, they have to be incarcerated to a point where we cannot let them continue freely to commit harm to others. Fine. So then how do we treat them? How do we fix the machine that's broken? And as an Aboriginal culture, once they have 
gone through their penance, gone through their sentence, you don't shun them. Yeah. They're yeah. back. Welcome back, brother. Right? Yeah. right? Welcome yeah. back, sister. You're now back with us. What you did was wrong, but you've now paid for it and you now realize yeah, why you, what you did that, was wrong. For us to get to that, we need to at least have some type of protocol where it's like, okay, let's say you are this character and you won't stop doing these horrendous crimes, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Or why, how, how do we create a protocol where we identify, okay, we have some preliminary data for why you behave this way. Right. Whether it's like, you know, we do brain scans, we do psychoanalyze you, whatever mm -hmm. it may be, but we have to start at least figuring out because the more data we get from each person, we can kind of look at patterns. Yes. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Exactly. Right, but we don't have enough data. We don't have these patterns yet. Or the sophistication, or sophistication to know all of the causal factors. That's why I created this project called the OzTalk project, yeah. which looks at all of the natural and all of the cultural biases that can influence a person's decision-making systems yeah. to pinpoint a, a time in which they acted adversely or wrongfully to a value system that was set within a society. If we want to be fair, and maybe we don't, maybe we don't care about fairness, but if that's your brother or your son or your dad or your mother or whomever, you still love that person. You hate what they're doing. Yeah. You yeah. know, you hate that and you don't want them to do that. Okay. But so how do we, person. yeah. How do we, how do we make them not want to do that again? If they're a pedophile, right? If they're a serial killer, whatever it is. See, that the pedophile wrong, thing for me is an interesting case. And mm -hmm. I know people don't like talk about it's taboo, but I want to fucking bring it up. Sure. Yeah. There's a young man that wrote an article. Um, he was about 18, 19 years yeah. old and he wrote an article admitting to it. As being a pedophile? Uh, being a pedophile. Really? Because he, he was, I mean, to his credit, he was mature enough and and aware enough that... He knew it was wrong. He knew it was wrong. So he, I didn't read the whole article. It was a few years ago. But he was looking for help. He was seeking help. Listen, they know. Like, that's ex oh, yeah. They know that's wrong. Yeah, but yeah. this is once again... A lot of them do justify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of them do justify. But for me, I'm wondering like, once again, the urge is so strong. Mm. And how much is genetic and how much is cultural? It's so strong. So yeah. we look at history. Pedophilia has been here since. Oh. Boop. Oh, yeah. 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 And since we say that those actions are wrong, okay. But now it's your brother. And it's yeah. like, bro, what are you doing? And he's like, I can't help it. And my wife's worked with them, right? Because she works with the kids that have been abused. Mm. But she's literally met with them. Mm. And they said, I'm going to jail. You know, my sentence starts next Monday and I go away for seven to 10 years. And the day I get out, I'm going to be doing this all See over See what again. I mean? You cannot reform me in that prison. So then my question is, the state is always a, a tug of war between paternalism and autonomy. Yeah. Allowing your citizens to be free without having to be a parent to say, whoa, 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 you can't do that. We have to stop the pedophile. We can't let them have so much autonomy that they abuse children. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how paternalistic are we going to be on them? Enough to not allow them to harm others. Okay. But now, as individuals within a society, do we have the right to tell that individual, your machine is broken? We know how to fix it, but it's going to require us to use gene therapy to correct whatever it is that's wrong with your machine that makes you have these urges to be with these kids. Are you okay with that? Now, if, if the pedophile says yes, and it is possible in the future to change them literally, yeah. to change their sexual desire from within, does the state ever have the right to usurp the citizen's autonomy if they say, no, this is how I was born and I like these kids. So I'm just going to keep going to jail if you don't mind. Do we then just say, all right, that's your call, bro. But we're going to keep you in jail forever because we can't trust you to be out and amongst children. Or anymore. the punishment is like, let's say they do it. You get the gene therapy. You, like it's just an automatic? That's, That's an interesting punishment. What about this? This is where things are going to go yeah. really sideways here, right? And get a little dark. We know Japan is leading the world. I knew we were going to go here. In the development of, of sexual devices. Yeah. Atom yeah, the robots. The automatons. Yeah, automatons. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what if they become so good at making them, they make children robots? I brought up this talking point before. I'm going to be in Japan. Japan. In a couple of weeks, yeah. and 
someone uh, close to me was t- telling me about this as well, that in some of these comic book shops, where they're like three, four, or five floors, yeah, at every floor you go up, it gets more and more very pornographic. Oh, is both, that right? Both the comics as well as the, the, the dolls. Uh-huh. She was telling me how there's the top floor, like the fourth or fifth floor of this one one, one in particular, and she says, there's a ton of them. No women are allowed. Only yeah. the men are allowed. Yeah. And mm. So her boyfriend and a few other people went, and it's just like, it, they're children at this point. Really? Yeah. Wow. So they're already there, and I was going to get to that because I was, I was hearing this another podcast but the idea of what about virtual reality what about robots what, how about if we can't fix it but treat it you have this urge i have you're uh, never going to hurt an actual human yeah being. there's two, yes. two do we want to foster you that. have an itch you, right here's the scratch exactly but my rebuttal to that is like one it's a robot do whatever the fuck you want with it right you're not no, harming it has anybody. no rights yeah there's not, no sentience no sentient it's just mechanical sure right so get your kicks in it however is this propagating? We're perpetuating the the ideal ideology that it's okay, and then that, yeah. will that transfer into real cases? Because yeah. the robot just can't do it. The VR can't do it quite like getting that kid, right? Yeah. Or it's like a feedback, like, oh, this is good, right? This is normalized now, yeah. so more people are into it. Right. Yeah. Now, if you really want to get dark, we know that during medieval times, people were married around fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen, yeah. So medieval. Like most of human history. Yeah. Yeah. We we know, but just to take as an example yeah. what was quite common, especially, especially amongst the aristocracy. Does that make it right? Are we more right now? Are we more civilized? Are we more woke now than we were during the medieval period in terms of what children's rights are? Because there was no delineation between a child and an adult till quite recently yeah, in well, Victorian the, England. We can we can pedophilia spe- specifically before Puberty. At right. 14, was it before puberty? Yeah, yeah. At 13, okay. 14. I don't remember what the term is, but there's another term. Mm. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people fall, a lot of men will fall into that category okay. of like teen porn and so on. But it, pedophilia is specific to pre, pre-pubescent. Yeah. That's right. Hmm. But you look at, for example, in science, we know that even now, like the prefrontal cortex isn't fully matured to like 21. Right. It's like, Right. Even older for guys, no? Yeah. yeah. It's not exact, but let's yeah. say around that age, sure. age group. And you look at biological health of a female, right? Around tw- in the 20s, like early 20s, a female is the most prime, the healthiest eggs. Right. The eggs she's given, given from the mother, is that's it. That's her genetic lottery. There's no magic ways of you making more eggs. Mm. It's all downhill from there. Right. Literally. Right. So there is a biological golden gap. Mm-hmm for the healthiest eggs right. for women. So that's biology, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, and that's well past 18. We're talking about like 19, 20, 21, 22. Sure. So for me, it's like you're going back to the medieval stuff. I think context matters. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't sit here and vilify them. Right. Right? I think, I think yeah. there's, a, there's that famous saying like, the vices of yesterday are today's virtues and today's virtues will be the vices of the mm-hmm. future. And longevity was much shorter yes. then as well, right? Yes. So, hmm. That's another thing too. It's like also when people are having kids, there's much later. That's right. It's just society is more difficult. You don't have a tribe to help you out anymore. Also another fact of like- And you don't need 15 kids you don't to need help fi- out. Well, social economics, yeah. right? It's like you're, when you have a career, when you're making money and you know you have your more self-interest, why am I going to have five kids? I can't. Mm-hmm. Nor do I want. Well, to. it was an asset before. Now it's a liability. It's a liability. Right? Before yeah. the more kids you had, the, the hence one the of asset. the biggest threats to human civilization is birth rates going into the future. Eighteen million babies only born in China last year for a population of a billion plus. Mm. So the lack of birth, the 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 decrease in birth rates, yeah. India yeah. decreasing, China yeah. decreasing. Japan's not having any. Japan's kids. not having not anything. Even having sex. Canada's not having oh. that many kids. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Interesting fact. Um, it's the duty of a Muslim to have a lot of kids. Is that right? Is that in the Quran or is that in? I think it's in the Quran. Okay. Yeah. What's the thing? Fi- spread, they're allowed spread, to have uh, spread, spread five, five wives, four wives, five wives. Four. It's four wives, four but wives? there's a lot of um, a lot of fine print to that. I think one of them is that the the wife has to 
a suggested improvement. And that's in the Hadith mm-hmm. or in the Quran? I think it's in the Quran. Okay. But basically, the wife has to, A, agree to it and promote it and be on board. The second piece of it is that whatever you do for the first... Bro, if you want to have it you today, to man, it you got to be some so if rich, you have a house balling the motherfucker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to have it. You got <laughs> yeah. you, you to be... Um, <laughs> like, shit. So in Playboys, is it, what's his name? Um, oh, Hefner. Hefner level yeah. to yeah. ensure that Dan Balzerian. Yeah, yeah, Dan Balzerian would be a good Muslim. He he would <laughs> he would be able to meet the criterion <laughs> of the four wives. So as long as each wife you know agrees to the next, yeah. the next. One, but that, it's not fiscally viable for no. This brings up like yeah. a funny thing. My so, another quick yeah. thing. Do you know how easy it is to get married and have a divorce in Islam? No, I'm, under Sharia law, under Sharia it's quite law. easy. Yeah, I divorced thee three times. Yeah, in a mosque, and that's yeah. me and a young lady just need one or two other um, witnesses, and we say we're married from this point on. Yeah, and then divorce. Well, in, the in Sharia law, in, in Islamic Sharia, patriarchy is like. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> don't get us started. Yeah, the guy has a good over there, yeah. man. Oh, like, man. King. No kidding. Is do you guys find the Hadith to the Quran similar to the Talmud to the Torah and Jewish? I have no culture? idea. Is the is it more of like the? Is it what scholars have discussed about the Quran and the legal law aspects? Is is that what? It's from it's, the little I understand of Sharia law. I'm not a big fan, right. and I don't think it belongs right. here in polite society. My, if you th- want to run your own court yeah. system, there are islands that are in international waters. You yeah. go do your thing there. <laughs> this is this is my thesis for whether it's a Talmud or the Hadith or any religious scripts. I'm like. At one point, some guy or guys got together and decided to write something to benefit themselves. Right. That's it. So using it as a power. That's it. End of well, story. Well, I will say, historically, religions started representing the disenfranchised in the mm. war. And if you take a look at Judaism, Christianity, including Islam, if you understood the context of what was happening in that area— and then you saw Islam coming, you'd say, holy shit, that's modernity. It's giving m- much more rights and privileges to women. There's During that era, women were literally um, objects, right? A man could have 10 wives and then remove all 10 next year and get another 10 wives. So most people don't recognize that when it's at four and these are the conditions. Yeah. That was a huge pullback mm. from what was actually okay. happening. But the thing that people understand, especially in the Middle East, because uh, it's, it's, Islam is pretty different when you go to Asia, like Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Islam in Middle East or the Arabian Peninsula, et cetera, predating Islam, where it was more, what are they called? Uh, uh, multiple gods. What's it called? Polytheist. Yeah. Yeah, it was very poly. They're, and this is, this goes to Judaism as well, mm-hmm. and uh, all the Abrahamic religions in the uh, in the area. There, it all goes to tribe and honor. A hundred percent. This religion stuff, it's like mm. on top of it's cultural first. Right. This all fucking existed well, we way about that before. before. Religion. Reza Aslan talks about it. Right. And when you identify as a Muslim from X country. It's a cultural identification. It's a cultural oh, yeah. identification. Yeah, yeah. More than it's, a religion. And this is why honor kills yeah. exist. It mm-hmm. predates all this religion It exists stuff. in some places and it doesn't exist Correct. in other Correct. places. Correct. General mutilation exists in some places. It doesn't exist in some mm. areas. You go to a... So an Afghan wedding is more alike to a Greek and Italian oh, like a Greek wedding Orthodox. Yeah. than it is yeah. to an Arabic mm-hmm. wedding. Right. And that's... Partly because Alexander the Great, one of his last stops was in Afghanistan. Yeah. And if you take a look at that region and say, well, how far is Afghanistan to, to Greece? We have our own version of tzatziki, chicken souvlaki yeah. with white rice yeah. and a certain salad. <laughs> yeah. And we dance with our arms out in mm-hmm. Afghanistan. It's very, very similar. And yeah. Interesting. Af- Afghans love ancient Greece. Interesting. And Alexander the Great. When I was in Greece for our honeymoon in 92... After two weeks of solid Greek food, I was pining for pasta. 
<laughs> Did you go from Italy to Greece? Or? No, straight to Greece. And I walked where Socrates and Aristotle and they all walked and the Acropolis and whatnot. But Acropolis, okay. I think it's overrated. I was just there last year. But just the sheer history of it being a philosophy major. I was doing my PhD at the time, but... It got fucked up, man. I was there. There was the graffiti everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. And really? a lot of pollution. A oh, lot yeah. Of Acropo- the, the Athens, Acrop- the whole Athens is fucked. Like the city. What? Fuck. Yeah. There's a lot of pollution. And people drive anything. Anything that can run... Like guy was driving oh, a lawnmower. Yeah. But you go to Acropolis, like on top of the hill, and yeah. you see it's, it's graffiti. The person. Oh, oh man. Yeah. But they're Pains repairing it all. They are they're slowly, yeah. Using sandblast. So I met um, a gentleman's old granny, Greek Greek family in Chicago. I visit, visited them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when this granny saw me, this Greek granny, the first thing she said is, where are you from? <laughs> right, and I said, I'm from Afghanistan. And she just grabbed my nose and goes, that's a Greek nose. Alexander oh, yeah. gave it to you. <laughs> really? I like that. <laughs> I said, yeah, you know your history. Yeah. 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 So by the end of the two weeks, I'm pining for pasta. I'm at a restaurant. <laughs> And I'm, I'm going to get dim sum after this. And I order it. Yeah, Maybe hungry. we should get Italian. Yeah. And, I'm, and I said, did you not? I said, <laughs> the Romans conquered you. Did they not leave any recipes behind <laughs> to make a decent sauce? Nothing. They were not impressed. But the thing I loved about Greece was small town, large. It didn't matter. When we went to a restaurant, it'd be like, how are you today, sir? I'm not bad. What do you got cooking today? Come, come. Right into the kitchen. Oh, that's just started funny. lifting lids. And I just pointed. That, that, what's that? Is that a fit? That. Yeah, you go, you go, we'll bring it to you. Like, it was just so cool, mm-hmm. so laid back. So my Greek friends will hate hearing this, but I love Greek food, but Afghan food is like Greek food, but just better. Oh, yeah? Uh, just a little bit better. Because <laughs> where we're located, we got uh, India, yeah. Iran, yeah. Um, Kashmir. Pakistan, yeah, the, uh, China. So there's just a little bit more salt, a little bit more spices. More yeah. But it's not as spicy as, say, Indian cuisine. Or right. It's not as, there's not that much noodles or anything like China. It's like Greek food, but with a little bit more kick. Yeah. Oh, I'll, have make, I'll have to get some Afghan food. Oh, for you guys. absolutely. Yeah, let's do it. Maybe Sick. Cool. Yeah. I think we'll wrap it at that. All right. Dim sum. Yeah. Yes, let's do this. Uh, Chris, <laughs> if people want to contact you or get more information, what's the best resource? CriticalThinkingSolutions.ca. All right, guys. Please go check out Chris's work. You know, you've heard him. He has so much information and knowledge. And like always, if you're listening to this on iTunes, leave a review. And if you're watching this on YouTube, Leave a comment below this video and I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.